know what's changed. I don't know anything that's changed, but it's uh, taking a long time for it to load. It may have nothing to do with the computer. It may be all the system or YouTube or something, but it's been bizarre. Okay. Announcements. I'm trying to think if there are any. Um, did want to say this. Several of you, close to half the class probably, have turned in the research paper, which is very good. And all but two people have turned in the first test. It's great that that many have, but it's not good that two people haven't, because I've already given out the last test, so it's not technically due yet, because we haven't quite finished the, uh, the chapter. But I really wanted to have the first ones in before you started working on the second because then people just get further and further behind. So I want to get those first ones back to you. But like I said, two people haven't turned it in yet. All right, let's see, anything else? I don't have, yes. I can't hear you. Oh, I have given out test two. Did you get one? Okay, then let me get it for you. The other thing I was going to say I've got everything that's been turned into me, into me so far has been graded. However, I have had zero time to sit down with uh, and get things on Blackboard. I was taking time in between classes to try to get stuff on Blackboard. And uh, so it's, uh, I hope this afternoon to be able to get some of that done, okay? Here's the problem. Second many term contracts are due today. The schedule for spring term is due tomorrow. And it seems like there's something else. Uh, all these deadlines have hit right at midterm. And so here's the test. Do you need that? Paper? You got it. Now, um, give me your two sheets. There's nine to graph. So, can you do two? See, it's front, turn the front and back to graph paper. So, do two on one side, two on the other, two and two. One of those sides, you need to do three. Okay? So, or just, I can get some more graph paper if you do that. Okay. All right. So, I will try to, in between doing all the other stuff, get your. Uh, grade, point, uh, grade book caught up in Blackboard. Uh, I'm guessing it's going to be later or other. Uh, once my 12, 15 class is over uh, and I grab a bite of lunch, then I've got to first get ready a lab for this afternoon in the afternoon class. Then I've got to get the contracts done. Then I'll try to get stuff put on Blackboard, and then I've got to work on spring term. If <laughs> yeah, it's, I may not get to Blackboard until sometime over the weekend, so because I think spring term has to be in by Friday tomorrow, so I may have to put off and do it then. All right, uh, I can't think of anything else. Any questions or anything we've done or haven't done? So oh. Well, Johnny comes lately. Okay. I was just saying, I thought this was the first time you hadn't been in here before the other class left. I came late today. Okay. All right. So, increased class size by 50%. And finally got a Y chromosome in here. So, that's good news. Okay. So, let's hit with this the last thing we're doing in 4.8, I think. Yes, it's harmonic motion. Anyone know what it is? Okay, basically, it's anything that repeats itself in a regular pattern. That can be classified as harmonic motion. Diurnal cycles, daylight darkness hours, bigger seasons, bigger uh, trends, you know, as in weather trends, climate trends, you know. Um, 
musical, you know, the harmonies, those are all related by wavelengths and, 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 and comparison to wavelengths. Um, tides, they go up, they go down, they go up, they go down, almost, almost with a regular pattern, okay, or most of them. So that's what we're talking about. One of the classic examples of the, well, let's see, the periodic nature of trigonometric functions is useful for describing the motion of, of, of a point or, or of, of a point on an object that vibrates, oscillates, rotates, or moves in any kind of wave motion. Just if you think of that, water waves, the ripple effect there, Doppler wave, sound, radar waves, radio waves, light rays, electromagnetic radiation, just about everything can be described, I mean, lots and lots of things described in harmonic motion and the periodic functions, trigonometric functions, especially sines and cosines, can be used to model and uh, this type of thing. One of the classic examples of periodic motion is a spring. Okay, for example, consider a ball bobbing up and down on the end of a spring as shown here. So what we have is a vertical spring here. We attach the ball to it. That stretches the spring a little bit. But as long as it sits right there without moving, that's happy. That's called this equilibrium position. That's where it wants to be. That's where it's comfortable to be. But if you were to stretch this spring, then the spring's going to be pulling back at you. Okay? So you stretch the spring, bring it all the way down 10 centimeters here below its equilibrium position. You are having to pull it down, adding force to it. Basically, you're adding energy to the system because it's spring potential energy. You pull it down. And then if you release it, you release it from rest, so it starts off with zero kinetic energy, but it has potential energy of the system in the spring. Okay? Don't worry about the energy right now. But what does it start doing? The moment you release it, the spring pulls it upward. Okay? And it starts with some zero velocity, and as it pulls upward, there is a force on it, so it's accelerating that ball. So it's going faster and faster and faster and faster because this force is pulling that way. When it reaches its equilibrium position, does it stop? No, because it has all that momentum. It has that kinetic energy. It moves right past it. But as soon as it moves past that, then it starts compressing the spring. Now the spring starts pushing back on it. So now the velocity starts decreasing. Uh, it is still going upward, but it starts decreasing because now the force is against it. And it decreases, decreases, decreases until it reaches 10 centimeters above. And now all the energy is in spring potential energy. It's lost all of its kinetic energy. You don't have to know that part. I'm just telling you that's what made it start, stop. To, the Darius, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All righty. Okay. Now, and once it stops, all this energy stored in the spring now is pushing against it, so immediately it's going to start coming back down. It does stop, start coming back down. Again, that energy of the spring is pushing, the force of the spring is pushing downward, so it's increasing speed, increasing speed, increasing speed, until it passes the equilibrium position where it wants to be at rest, but now it has all this speed. So it keeps moving past that and just keeps going up and down and up and down and up and down. Now, does it do that forever? No, not in real life, because, excuse me, because Okay. It doesn't do that forever because the spring has little bits of friction between the molecules 
and stuff, and it will, and even air resistance, it will lose energy at the top. But if it was a frictionless system and no air resistance, it would keep going forever. Of course, that's an ideal system as well. That simple harmonic motion. Notice the maximum displacement here, negative, will be matched by the maximum positive displacement. It can't go any further than that, okay? And then it pushes back down, but it can't go any further than this. Now, all of it's called the energy considerations. We're not getting into the whys of it. We're just observing that's what happens, okay? That's an example of harmonic motion. Okay. So here's describing what I was just saying. Suppose if you centimeter, you know, 10 centimeters is the maximum distance the ball moves vertically, either upward or downward from its equilibrium or rest position. What do you think that would be raised at? in expressing this as a sine and cosine function. That 10 centimeters, maximum displacement up or down. Remember how we did our sine and cosine functions? We had those parameters, A, B, C, D. What would be expressing how far above or below equilibrium position that would be? Period would be how long it takes. Amplitude, that's exactly the 10 centimeters would be your amplitude. Suppose further that the time it takes for the ball to move from maximum position displacement above zero to the maximum displacement below zero and then back again to the original position is four seconds, what would that be? The period. That would be the period. Assuming that the ideal conditions for perfect elasticity, that would say no internal friction and no air resistance, no friction, no air resistance, the ball would continue to move up and down, and up and down, regular uniform motion ad infinitum. Okay, never stop. That's an ideal situation, not realistic <laughs> in reality. Okay. For this spring, you can conclude that the period or the time for one complete cycle is four seconds. There, that's the same period we were talking about before. It's amplitude, maximum displacement from the equilibrium. That was our amplitude. Now, what was the frequency? That's the sort of the new word here. Frequency is back up here. The period is the time to do one cycle. One up, down, and up again, right? One cycle. Frequency is the cycles it does in one time interval, okay? So in other words, if the period is four seconds, the frequency is one cycle per four seconds. That's what this says, so this is one four. And here's Justin. Alright. Motion of this nature can be described by sine or cosine curve. Period, amplitude, frequency. We haven't introduced before, but it's just the reciprocal of the period. Okay? That's called simple harmonic motion. So here's the definition for that simple harmonic. I just want to open this again. It's leaving my death on the water. A point that moves on a coordinate line is in simple harmonic motion when the distance v from the origin at any time t is e given either by v is equal to. Now, this v is not the same v that we used as a parameter before. Okay? Forget that. This A is the same, but that B is different. The distance at any time T is A sine omega T, or D is equal to A cosine omega T. Now, what we used before was a B here, right? BT. 
and we said the v was 2 pi over the period. So this omega is 2 pi over period, and that's exactly what we get here. Uh, if omega is 2 pi over the period, the period is 2 pi over omega. Multiply both sides of that. The frequency is omega over 2 pi. The reciprocal of your reciprocal of the period. Okay? Now, what would we classify omega as? Since you get it, divide by 2 pi and you get it, this is the, the frequency per period, you might say. That's the frequency. Then, we call this symbol here, omega, either the angular speed or angular frequency. Okay? So there's just actually angular frequency. Where the frequency is, two, is that angular frequency divided by 2 pi. Okay. Now, Same figure we had before. It says, write an equation for the simple harmonic motion of the ball described in this figure, okay, where the period is four seconds. What is the frequency of that harmonic motion? So this is example six that we find at the top of page 334, but it refers to this figure that we had on 333, okay? Write an equation for the simple harmonic motion of that ball described in this, okay? Now, where are you starting from? E yeah, your equilibrium position, which would be zero. So what trig function starts at zero? And you're only choosing one of the two, sine or cosine? Sine, okay. If you were starting from up here, I would say use a cosine. If you're starting from down here, I'd say use a negative cosine, okay? Because you're starting at the negative. So this, let's do the sine. So the equation will be of the form I've got to get my pen activated. Okay. Y, they call it D, but why not call it Y? That's what we've always called it. That's your vertical displacement. Is equal to A sine omega T. Only thing different here, what we were calling B, we're now calling omega. Because omega we call the angular frequency, okay? Now, what would be your A here from this figure here? If it goes down maximum, a minimum of minus 10 centimeters, maximum plus 10 centimeters. Say again? That would be 10. So the A would be 10. So this would be uh, 10 actually 10 centimeters, to be correct about it, times the sine of omega t. Now we've got to figure out what the omega is. Okay? They told us the period was four seconds. And that omega, remember, is just what your b was before. So how was omega or b related to period? For sine and cosine. Two pi. two pi over period. Or period is two pi over B. So you could do it that way too. Um, so two pi over four. Okay? Which would be pi over two. Okay? So there's your omega. 
this is equal to 10 centimeters times the sine of pi halves t, okay? Sine pi halves t. One little problem. This is starting at the equilibrium position, but where does it go first? Down. Sine usually goes up. So guess how we deal with that? Yeah, make it a negative. So we'll make it a negative. Minus 10 sine pi halves t. Now, they may not come up with exactly the same one. If they do it in cosine, it'll be pretty simple. Okay? But there we have it. We've written an equation. Y is equal to 10, negative 10 centimeters times the sine of pi half t. Okay? Now, what is the frequency of that harmonic motion? What was frequency? Say again. Okay. Frequency is 1 over period. What was the period? Four seconds. So the frequency is one quarter and sometimes it's written as cycles per second. Okay, I put CY for cycles. A cycle is a unit, okay, but that's how many times it cycles in a second. It goes through one cycle four times in a second. I'm sorry. It goes through a quarter of a cycle in a second, meaning it goes through one cycle in four seconds. Okay? So its frequency is one quarter cycles per second. Now, sometimes you'll actually see that expressed as CPS, cycles per second. Most correctly, you might say, it would be, or most commonly, one-fourth, uh, usually written a second to the minus one, meaning per second. Because cycle really isn't a unit. I can't get my eraser to come up. There we go. Okay. Now, there is a unit for frequency. Does anyone happen to know it? That would be... You should know, yeah. Hertz. Your computers, everything does by what's their speed. So much many hertz. How many cycles per second? We are up to kilohertz, megahertz. Have we gotten to gigahertz yet? Speed of processing information. I know we have memory, but do we have that kind of speed yet? We do? Yeah, okay. I wouldn't be at all surprised. One of these days we're going to be up in the terahertz range, probably. How many processes do we do in a second? Okay. All right. So, let's see how they did. They started the same way we did because the spring is the equilibrium. D is equal to zero. When T is equal to zero, we use the sine equation. A sine omega T. Okay? And moreover, because the maximum displacement from zero is either 10 up or 10 down, we use amplitude. Its absolute value of that would be uh, either a would be either plus or minus 10, because the amplitude is 10. Okay? The amplitude is 10. So A could be plus or minus. Okay? Because the period, like we said before, the period is 2 pi over omega, or if you want to go back the way we did it before, omega or B is 2 pi over period. And divide both sides of the period, multiply both sides by omega, whatever. Divide by omega, divide 
Oh, God, God, here is that you four is superior, then multiply here, divide there, yes, and make it equal time half. And that would be the angular frequency that how many <coughs> angles, what angle it goes through in a second. Okay? How many angles it goes through how many radians it goes through in a second. Okay. So consequently, the equation for motion is 10 times the sine of phi hat of t. Now we had that, but then because it started off going down, I changed it to minus 10. Because remember, the amplitude is the absolute value of a. It looked like to me the way they did the thing, it went down before it went up, so therefore that would have been a minus 10 in my book. But 10 is 5. Note that the choice of A equal 10 or negative 10 depends on whether initially you move it up or down. And since the picture had it going down, I chose minus 10. Okay, the frequency, however, was. Now they go back and do this formula. Why? The frequency is 1 over the period. They already gave you the period, it's real easy to do it. But if you do it this way, that would be pi halves divided by 2 pi, which would be pi halves times 1 over 2 pi, which would be uh, right. yeah. pi halves divided by 2 pi is the same as pi halves times 1 over 2 pi. And so that you, the pi's cancel out, and then you have one over four. Okay, they sure picked a very convoluted way to go about doing that. Much simpler, just invert the reciprocal of the period. All right. I forgot to mark Whitney. I, mean, I saw you come in, but I forgot to mark you. Okay, let's see. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Three, four, six, seven. Got it. All right. There is a checkpoint there. I would say well worth an effort to do it. Okay? Now. One illustration of this relationship between sine waves and harmonic motion is the wave motion that results when a stone is dropped into a calm pool of water. The waves move outward in roughly the shape of sine and cosine waves. Okay? Now, I would classify this one as a cosine wave if you're starting in the center, because it's starting at its maximum, going down to its max, up to its max, down to its max, up to its max, down to its max, up to its max, down to its max, up to its max. Now, you know in reality, the waves sort of deteriorate over time because even water has friction. Okay, you don't think of it, but it does. Uh, strong hydrogen bonds tend to dampen that a little bit. And remember, did we do our damp periodic motion? I think we did earlier. Okay. As an example, suppose that you are fishing and your fishing bobber is attached so it doesn't move horizontally. You don't allow it to move horizontally, only vertically. As the wave moves outward from the drop stone, so your bobber is out here perfectly still, but you drop the stone and the wave starts moving out from it. Okay? Bobber doesn't feel a thing until this part of the wave approaches this and then the bobber goes up and then down. So it's doing it right here. It's sitting right there at equilibrium until the wave comes, it goes up, and then it starts going down, and then all the way down to here, and then goes up again, and just goes up and down, up and down. If you don't allow it to go uh, So this is showing the wave progressing, and the bobber doesn't do a thing until that first wave gets there and it reaches it at that point and then it moves it up a little bit a little bit more a little bit more 
finally three feet of tape from this side here, and then it starts going down again. So it reaches the peak here, so it falls here, up and down. I don't find that a particularly awe-inspiring figure, okay? It doesn't say a lot to me. I have to sort of figure out what's happening to get it to make sense. So you like the illustration should make reality simpler. I have to use reality to make the figure look make sense. I, I don't find it particularly satisfying. Okay. For some reason, they're not doing example seven. So let's us do example seven. I'll need to find some white space to do it. How about right here? Okay, right there. Now, okay, excuse me. All right. Given, given the equation, excuse me. Given the equation for simple harmonic motion, d is equal to 6 times the cosine of 3 quarters pi t. Okay. Find A. Okay. The maximum displacement. Anyone give me that? There's your equation. What is the maximum displacement? I'm sorry? Six, exactly. Maximum displacement is six. That's your amplitude, okay? The B part says the frequency. How do we get the frequency from that? one over the period. Okay, so we need to get the period. What is the period given that thing? What is the period? Okay, it's 2 pi over our B or our omega, which is 3 pi over 4, right? Or you could have done it the other way, 3 quarters pi is equal to 2 pi over period. That's how we used to do it. We're just doing it the other way now. So let's do this. This will be 2 pi divided by 3 pi over 4, which is the same as 2 pi times 4 over 3 pi. Well, the pi's divide away, and that gives you the period is 8 thirds. You can assume it's in seconds, but they haven't given you any units, so just leave it as 8 thirds. Just like the period, I mean amplitude, we just said 6. We don't know if that's 6 meters, 6 inches, 6 millimeters, 6 watt. We don't know. Okay? But that gives you the period. What did you say the frequency was? 1 over the period, which would then be, which is 3 over 8. Now that usually we can safely say is hertz. We don't know that for certain, but that's not a bad thing to do, or just 3 eighths. They're not using any units we don't have to. Okay? So there is the B part, the frequency. The C part. The value of D when T is equal to 4. So we're looking for D when D is 6 times the cosine of 3 quarters pi times 4. Because when T is equal to 4, they don't say seconds. I would assume that, but we, don't, we can't guarantee it, so that's not. So what would D be? Well, the 4s divide away, right? A 
Agreed? To do what? Find the cosine. Okay, no, but it's three fourth is three fourths t. The t is part of what you take the cosine of. So you need to multiply that first. So now we've got the cosine of three pi. Anyone tell me what that is? Okay. Cosine starts at one. What's the period of the cosine? Two pi. Uh, so in two pi it would be back at one, and it goes another pi, so what where is it? Okay. Started at one. At pi halves at zero. At pi it's negative one. At three halves pi it's back to zero. Two pi it's completely one cycle, it's back at one. Then zero is five out of five. Okay. So it's negative one. So cosine of three pi is negative one. Six times negative one is negative six. Whatever those units are. Okay? And D, not D the problem, but part D. The least positive value of T for which D is equal to zero. So we want D to be zero is equal to six cosine three quarters pi. I can't write T. And you want the smallest t to make that happen. I think they said the smallest positive t to make that happen. That is a 4 down there. That is a really ugly 4. So let's see if I can make it any better. A little bit better. Okay. Well, let's solve this for t. First thing we're going to do is divide by six. What does that give us? Zero. Okay, that's pretty easy. So now we've got that cosine of three pi over four t is equal to zero. And we want the smallest value for t that will make that happen. Well, where is cosine zero? The smallest value. Pi half. So we want our three quarters. Three pi fourths t to equal pi halves. Okay? So what can we do? Okay, how about multiplying by 4, which is the same thing that you're, you're suggesting. But let's say get rid of that first. Okay, that would be 2. Now divide by 3 pi, which is the same as what you were saying, dividing by 3 quarter pi. Okay. Okay, 3 pi's go out here. So t is equal to 2 thirds. Two-thirds of whatever unit you're measuring T in. Seconds, hours, minutes, fortnights, whatever you're measuring the time in. It's two-thirds. Okay? So, let's see how the book did. Maximum displacement, six. They got it right. Good for them. Frequency, three-eighths of a cycle per second. Well, wait. Cycle per unit time. So probably I shouldn't say hertz, okay, because hertz is cycles per second. So it would be cycle per time interval, whatever it is, okay. I shouldn't even write that down, okay. That's B. C was negative 6 because of 
times t equal 4, you get 3 pi over from where you started, 3 pi cosine is negative 1. Add d, set the equation equals 0, divide by 6, and then take the inverse cosine of that, or you ask yourself where, at what value would a 3 quarters pi t would give you a cosine of 0, the smallest one would be a pi half. Okay? So, take the pi halves, <coughs> multiply by 4, divide by 3 pi, and you get 2 thirds. They got it. All right, any questions on that? This is example six, not seven, so just trying to squeeze on past this. All right, any questions on 4.8? Any questions on chapter four? Okay, we've already had the first test on the first four sections. I've given you the second test on the last four sections. Anyone here need that second test? Anyone here need more graphing? Okay. All right. Now, since we finished the chapter just now, wait, wait, wait. We haven't yet. Let's do the vocabulary. Okay. Page 336, top of the page. A blank measures the acute angle that a path or a line of sight makes with a fixed north-south line. A blank measures the acute angle. A bearing, okay, very good. Number two, a point that moves on a coordinate line is said to be in simple blank blank when its distance d from the origin at time t is either given by d is equal to a, cos a sine omega t or D is equal to A cosine omega T. Harmonic motion. Very good. Number three. The time for one complete cycle of a point in simple harmonic motion is the blank. The time for one complete cycle of a point in simple harmonic motion is its period. Number four. The number of cycles per second or per time period of a point in simple harmonic motion is its frequency. Actually. Okay, homework exercises here include any of the odds, 5 through 13, uh, either 15 or 17, or both, any of the odds, 19 through, I think last time, I just went to 45, so do some of those. Do some that deal with lengths or heights, distances, that kind of thing. Uh, do some that deal with angles of elevation or depression. Uh, do some that deal with navigation uh, or survey. Okay, and then do some to just deal with geometry. Okay? Those are the ones I gave you prior to today. Today, let's add to those either 47 or 49 or both, and any of the odds 50. No, just, no do 51. It's the only one like that. Then do either 53 or 55 or both. And then any of the odds are either 57 or 59 or both. You're certainly welcome to look at 61 as a true false. Well worth a look. Okay? Now, since you, for those of, well, none of you are working on your test still, I don't think, first test. Those on the second test, it starts at section 4.5. You might find the uh, material on page 341. Possibly it'll be a little helpful. Section 4.6 is that. 
4.7 and 4.8 are all on that page. Now, if you need more review exercises to help you figure out how to work some of the test problems, that would start probably on 543 or 45, because again, odd answers are in the back, and countcheck.com has worked out solutions for the odd number exercises. So either 43 or 45 or both, either 47 or 49 or both, either 51 or 53 or both, 55 or 57 or both, 59 or 61 or both, 4.5, any of the odds, 63 to 67, and then probably do 69. 4.6, either, either 71 or 73 or both, do 75, sorry. I can't breathe. Do either 77 or 79 or both, either 81 or 83 or both, do 85 and then either 87 or 89 or both, and do 91. And then at 4.8, you just have 93 and or 95. There are some exploration, a couple of true false, one true false, and some conjectures and things like that. Now, if you also need a little bit more, the chapter test on page 345, the second half of the chapter is pretty much covered in 12 through 20. Okay? Uh, these, I think the chapter test, all the answers are in the back. However, CalcChat still only has the odd numbers. So, if you're just using the back of the book, any of the odd, uh, any of the uh, 12 to 20 will be in the back, the answers, but only the odds, 13 to 19, will be in the back. Okay. And there's a little blurb on proof of mathematics on the Pythagorean theorem, uh, which would be pretty interesting, I would think. And then a few other things, I'll do order without that. Okay. Man, I feel like I've run through the ringer here. I can't breathe, so I'm. Uh, Okay, finally it's this time. Okay, so let's move on to chapter five. Okay, everybody does have a copy of the second test. Please, if you have it, act. Done so yet, turn in the first test, and I hope you're working on the second one. Okay, we're going to get going on chapter five, analytic trigonometry. Now, I don't know why, but a lot of people find this the hardest chapter. Some people that don't care for trig much, you may find the first chapter four fairly challenging, but judging from your test scores, I would say you didn't seem to. Uh, but analytical trigonometry has a bit more Or what you call it, maybe a little more challenge to it. Okay, I don't know. We'll see. Okay, chapter five, analytic trigonometry. We have five sections in it. We'll do all five before you do the next test. So it's a little bit longer, but some of these sections aren't as long as the others were, so we should finish it about the same time. Hope so anyway. 5.1 is using the fundamental identities. Now, chapter 4, the first half of it anyway, showed these fundamental identities over and over and over again. Showed them for the unit circle, showed them for uh, triangles, showed them for coordinates. It showed them in just about every form you could think of. They're really important, and you're using them forever. 
We're going to do it in this section. It's recognized in light of the fundamental trigonometric identity. Nothing too new. You've done just like all of them before. We'll use the fundamental trigonometric identity to evaluate trigonometric functions. We did a little bit of that before. Simplify trigonometric expressions. Certainly, we probably did a little of that before. And rewrite some trigonometric expressions. That will be a lot like what we were doing, but maybe a little bit twist on it. So the introduction here, we'll learn how to use the following identities. We'll use, use the fundamental identities to do the following. As I just said, evaluate trigonometric functions, simplify trigonometric expressions, develop additional trigonometric identities, and solve the trigonometric equations. So, big challenge. Guess what? Have we seen these before? I think these are all pretty much what we've seen before. Toward the bottom, we may not have seen them, but I think we talked about them. If not, we'll talk about them now. First, your reciprocal identity. Get to know these like the back of your hand. I'm not a memorizer. I don't encourage you to memorize. I do encourage you to use them frequently enough you know what they are, okay? And you should have these pretty much down pat now. A sine is reciprocal of the cosecant, same way the cosecant is reciprocal of sine, okay? Cosine is reciprocal of secant, secant is reciprocal of cosine. Tangent is reciprocal of cotangent, and cotangent is reciprocal of tangent. Now let's step back for a moment. What can you never divide by? Simple question. Simple answer. Zero. You can never divide by zero. Well, fortunately, neither cosecant uh, or secant is ever zero. Remember, cosecant and secant start at one and go a negative one and go up and down from there, but it's never zero. So you never have a problem with the sign or cosine. However, your signs and cosines are zero every half period, right? Okay? Your sign and the frequency of the half period. Uh, so there will be places where cosecant and secant are not defined. And they're the same places that tangent and cotangent are not defined because the tangent is the sine over cosine, and cotangent is cosine over sine. <coughs> so, secant has a vertical asymptote in exactly the same place that tangent has, and vice versa. And cotangent has a vertical asymptote in the same place that cosecant does, and cotangent does. And it's not the same place that cosecant does. Okay, so there's your quotient identity. Now, in some previous book I taught, or back when I first learned this, we also called them the ratio identity. I kind of like ratio better than quotient, but they're both correct. Now, Pythagorean identity. You are going to use these a whole lot. The most common Frequently used expression of it, sine squared u plus cosine squared u is always, 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 always equal to one. Okay? You can take this expression, subtract the cosine squared from both sides, sine squared is equal to one minus cosine squared. We use that one a lot too, but it's based on this one. Or you can subtract sine squared from both sides and have cosine squared equal to one minus sine squared. That's used a lot. Or you can take either one of those, the one I just said, cosine squared is one minus sine squared, take the square root of both sides, and you have cosine squared, so cosine u is equal to plus or minus, which is one minus sine squared. Okay? So you can manipulate these all kinds of ways. You can also divide every one of these terms by cosine squared. Sine squared over cosine squared is tangent squared. Cosine squared over cosine squared is 1. 1 over cosine squared is secant squared. That gives you this one. Okay? Or 
you just go off the tangent, by subtracting one from both sides. You can subtract ten to square root of both sides, get one is equal to two to square root of tangent. Or you can go back and divide everything on this side by sine squared. And that would be one plus cotangent squared is equal to cosecant squared. That gives you this. All of these come from this one simple Pythagorean identity. And then you can manipulate that. You have cosine, cotangent squared from this side. You have one from both sides. Subtract. Uh, All right, now I think we hit these earlier too, but just to remind ourselves, they're called the cofunction identities. That the sine of the complement of u is going to be the cosine. And similarly, the cosine of the complement of u is sine. The tangent of the complement of u is cotangent of u, the cotangent of the complement. The secret of the complement of u is cosecant u, the cosecant of the complement of u is secret u. Those are your cofunction identities. Or, sorry, my throat is hurting my throat. Sorry, I just bought something to drink into the class, so I don't like to do that, but I really need it now. Alright, now, I know we've mentioned, I don't know if they ever wrote them down like this, the even and odd identity. Okay? Sine, tangent, secant, I mean, uh, cosecant and cotangent are all odd functions. Meaning, the sine of negative u is negative sine of u. The cosecant of negative u is negative cosecant of u. The tangent of negative u is the negative tangent of u. The cotangent of negative u is negative cotangent. Only cosine and its reciprocal secret are even functions. Cosine and negative u is the same. It's the same. <coughs> Sorry. It's the same as the cosine of u. The secret of negative u is the same as the secret of u. And here's cosine. All right. Okay. Now. At the bottom of the page 350, we're in section 5.1 now. You did get a copy of the uh, Second text. Um, things I already have said is that the Pythagorean identity we could write in several different ways. One of these is sine of u is plus or minus uh, the square root of one minus cosine squared u. Okay, you get that from the fundamental Pythagorean identity of sine squared. U plus cosine squared U is equal to 1. Subtract cosine squared from both sides. Take the square root of both sides. That gives you this. Or tangent squared U. If you start with the 1 plus tangent squared U is equal to secret squared U. Subtract 1 from both sides. That gives you secret squared U minus 1. Tangent squared U. Take the square root of both sides. And you have tangent U is equal to plus or minus the radical. Square <coughs> u plus minus one. Sorry, that's odd. Now, in both of those, when you have a plus or minus, that doesn't mean either answer is correct. It depends on where are you, Waldo. Okay, if you are in the first or the second quadrant with u then you use the positive, because sine is positive in the first and second quadrant. If you're in the third or fourth quadrant with u, 
then you use the minus because the sign is negative in the second case in the third and fourth place. Similarly, on the with tangent, if you're in the first or third quadrant, you use the positive sign. If you're in the second or fourth quadrant, you use the negative sign. Okay? So the sign isn't arbitrary. You have one or two possibilities, figure out where you are, and then what sign aligns with that. All right. So what we're going to do next is use these fundamental identities. What common application? I, I see most of you are fairly well bundled up. Dustin doesn't have on any arms, but I'm up here getting cold. I think that's what's messing with my head and everything else. And the only thing is this morning, the first class is the full classroom almost. I think the body got too sheltered. Now the smaller class is just really really chilly up here. No, I was probably pretty cold to begin with. What common application of trigonometric identities is to use given values of trigonometric functions to evaluate other trigonometric functions. And didn't we do this a lot on the first test, the first half of chapter four? And we'll continue to do it. So don't think just because we've done the been there, done that, you can get a t-shirt and go home. Don't. You're going to use these things over and over and over again. Okay? So let's do example one. Use the values, okay? This is what they give you. Secant u is equal to negative three halves. Now, before I read any further, I want to stop and ask myself, does that make sense? Can secant u ever be negative three halves? Is that an allowed value for secant u to have? No, secants can be, I said this, for secants or cosecants, they start if, if it's 1 and it goes up, or negative 1 and goes down. Remember the graphs? They do that. So yeah, that is a legitimate value. If that had been negative 2 thirds, would that have been legitimate? No, because secant you can never be between plus or minus 1. It's always outside. Higher than plus 1, higher or equal to plus one, equal to or less than minus one. So that is legitimate. And tangent u is greater than zero. What does that add to the situation? Well, let's back off a minute. First, we already said secant u can be a negative three halves. Now the question is, where is second, could secant u be a negative three halves? Where is secant negative. I'll give you a hint. Not in the first quadrant. Why? Everything's positive in the first quadrant. So, where can secret be negative? Second? Second, it certainly could be. Second and third. Secret is reciprocal of cosine. And cosine is, remember, our acrostic, all the units take calculus. Okay? All the trig functions are positive here. Only sine and its reciprocal, cosecant, are positive here. Tate is tangent. Tangent and its reciprocal, cotangent, are positive there. Calculus, cosine. Cosine and its reciprocal, secant, is positive there. So secant is negative either in the second or third quadrant. Okay? Here's the other way to look at it. If you need another way. Secant is R over X. Remember? R being the radius, the hypotenuse, whatever. Always positive. So where is X negative? X is negative in the second and third quadrant. It's positive in the first and second quadrant. So secant uh, U is can have the value negative three halves. It could have it either in the second quadrant or the third quadrant. Because that's the only two quadrants 
it's negative. So what does telling you that can use is greater than zero tell you? Where is tangent u greater than zero? Otherwise known as positive. Okay, first and third quadrant. Secret has to be, or to be negative has to be second or third. Both of those will tell you, together tell you, it has to be in the third quadrant. That's what the tangent actually picture tells you which quadrant is that. Use that. So use that to find the values of all six trigonometric functions. What do you think the easiest of these six trigonometric functions will be? Cosine. Let me get my pen activated here. Let's see if this will do it. Yes, it did. Okay, so we'll do cosine first. Cosine of u is going to be what then? Which is? Okay, which is? Negative two-thirds, right? And they gave us, so this is actually the easier one, secret of u, because it says all six trigonometric functions. Well, they gave you secret u, and this is minus three halves. So cosine u will be the reciprocal of that, minus two-thirds. All right. From here, we've got four more to do. Sine of u, cosecant u, tangent u, and cotangent u. Goodness gracious. Everything else now, my eyes are so dry it hurts to see the book. I don't know if it's bright lights or what, but that's what it does in my mind. Okay, which one of these do you think might be the next easier one to do? Second? I can't hear you. Cosica. Okay, how would you get Cosica? Say that again. I can't think of one. There is the co function identity, or, uh, but that really tells you almost nothing here. Say that again. Sign you said. Is that what you said? Tangent would be easy. Okay, how would you get tangent? All right. There is a Pythagorean identity that relates tangents and secret. Can you tell me what that one is? One plus tangent squared u equal. I'll leave it up to you. What you want to do? Negative three halves squared. Okay, what she said was secant squared u. Secant squared is, I mean, secant u is is negative three halves. So we're going to take negative three halves and square it. And what does that come up be? Nine fourths. Okay. Now it's not too unreasonable then to. Subtract one from both sides. And how many fourths is one? Four fourths. Okay, so subtract four fourths from the right hand side, one from the left hand side, same value. So now we got that tangent squared of u is equal to five fourths. And what can we deduce from that? Okay, take the square root of both of those. So tangent of u is technically plus or minus the square root of 5 over the square root of 4. The square root of 4 is 2, right? 
But we were already given some information on tangent u. What was it? It's positive. We already said it was in the third quadrant. So which one do we use? Just the plus. The answer can't be two answers, it's only one. So this will be tangent u is the square root of 5 over 2. Okay? What else will be fairly easy to do? Cotangent, what will that be? 2 over root 5. Now, if you don't like radicals in the denominator, that could be expressed as Okay, okay, yeah, 2 square root of 5 over 5, okay? All right, goodness gracious, dragging. Now, what next? Sign. How do you want to approach sign? One more. Okay, the quotient, yeah, the tangent quotient rule. So we have that tangent u, which is the square root of 5 over 2, is equal to sine u, that's what we're looking for, over the cosine u, which is negative 2 thirds. Okay, so basically what we do here is multiply both sides of the equation by negative 2 thirds, right? Alright, the twos will divide away. Goodness gracious. Yeah, over here, the negative two thirds divide away. So that leaves you sine u is equal to negative the square root of 5 over 3. Right? which would then give you cosecant, which would be negative 3 over root 5. Unless you don't like having radical for the denominator, then it would be negative 3 root 5 uh, over 3. No. Yeah, 3 root 5 over 5. Sorry. I lost what I was doing. Okay. There we found it. Now, you didn't have to follow that route. I agree. Once you know secret, the easiest thing to do is cosine. Okay? Now, once you have cosine, you can use the other Pythagorean theorem to get sine. And you could have gone that route. So once you got that, then the tangent would be the, the quotient between those two. It would be square root of 5 over 2, positive. Okay? So once you have side, you can also get cos cosecant by the reciprocal. And once you have tangent, you can get cosecant. Check and see how they did on their answers. It looks like they did okay. Sign was, well, wait, here we have them. Let me clear this out of the way. And let's see what they got. Cosine is equal to 1 over secant. Okay. All right, it's just stepping through and doing the problems pretty much like we did them. Uh, they chose to use the sine cosine Pythagorean identity, which I said you could use perfectly fine, and that came out with sine squared is 5 ninths. Uh, because secret is 
negative and tangent positive, you have to be in the third quadrant. So the sign would be negative, square root of 5 over 3. We went about it a different way, but they got the same answer. Uh, once you have that, you have a cosecant u, which is, boy, do they have something wrong there, don't they? Yeah. When I looked at that, I said, what's wrong with me? They did minus 3 over 2, which would be secret u, not cosecant u. So cosecant u would be 1 over sine u, which would be 3 over 5 u, so what is it, 5? Is in uh, here. And then that goes up here. Just down here. Wrong is not the right number there. That would be negative 3 over root 5. Okay. I don't know how they did that. Okay. Cosine, we already got, was negative 2 thirds. Secret was. Wait a minute. A bait. Okay, they did it again. Okay, they put one over, they put one over cosine, but then wrote it as one over sine. So this is totally wrong too. This is minus, I can't believe this, minus three over two. Okay, yeah. And then tangent is sine over cosine, which would be positive five, five root five over two. Yeah. No, in the book they've got it right. On the slides they got it totally wrong. And cotangent is, and I think they got that one right. Two root five over five or two over root five. All right. I my throat is going on me. Let me run down to my office for just a minute and get me something to drink. What's that? Oh, it is, isn't it? Okay. I'm sorry, I was thinking with you. All right, finish well. Okay. Um, homework exercises here. There's just a few. I think you can do any of the odds 7 through 13. At least 7 through 10. Or 7 through 9. We may do some of the other like that. All right, we'll pick up and go with example 2 next time. I've already got it marked. Is that Huh? Well, actually what it is, they're still in air conditioning mode. They haven't even turned on the heat yet. And uh, the good news is they turn the system off overnight so the building sort of warms up. Then they turn it on in the morning and it starts cooling. Fortunately, I had a big class in here, so actually the room was warmer than what the set temperature was. The other thing they've done, all term, when it was hot outside, they had to set for 70, I think, in here. And now that it's gotten cooler outside, they've set it for 68. So now we really freeze, so I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I can't see my yeah. Yes? I can't see my okay. Let me turn this off, so...